Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Blaney Philosophy. This week we have a guest, and his name is Anthony Rebutanera. And he has been gracious enough to give me a lot of feedback on the show. And we sat down last week and we had like a pre-show talk and we had some really good topics that we covered. And I'm really looking forward to <clears throat> getting deeper into things this week. So, Anthony, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Tommy. I appreciate it. So you are a, a, uh, a renaissance man of sorts, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, uh, yeah, I'd agree with that, sure. I think you have some thoughts on philosophy that are very worth getting into. So I'll just ask you an open-ended question to start off. Do you have a personal philosophy? Um, that's a great question. I think uh, the quick answer to that is is not exactly, but kind of. Um, what I mean by that is over the years what's evolved is this uh, approach where I like to take a structural approach to things. Whether it's as simple as starting a new job or hopefully, you know, beginning a new romance or friendship. I like to understand where things are, level set, structure them out. Now, I don't do this, you know, apparently to the person. Of course, I don't want them to think it's a structural relationship. <laughs> but uh, internally for myself, I try to remember uh, previous situations that might fit into that new relationship and try to take positive steps to build a relationship or the job or the experience or whatever it is um, from the beginning in a quote unquote right way. And we can get into what I define as right, but that's kind of what I mean by structure. To back up a little bit, so where did you grow up? Uh, I was born and raised uh, here in Stanford, Connecticut, my friend. All right. So, yeah. so I've left and I didn't leave. <laughs> so you have a. So what do you what do you mean you left and you didn't? Well, leave? I've left in the sense that I've been very very lucky to be able to travel the world, um, but I'm still where I was born. So I very much understand the town. I know the folks here. I have a lot of roots here. But I also have much more, I would like to think, global perspective than you would think somebody that was Italian. <laughs> Italian. Yeah. So what what, um, what are the countries that you've been to that made an impact on you? Uh, I think I lost count, but I think my total, the last time I checked was something like 25, 26 countries around the world. The ones that I think made the most impact on me were, were, were countries like Germany, uh, countries like uh, Peru, um, China in many ways, uh, the UAE for sure, for sure, in the Middle East, and Italy. For some reason, I've gone back to Italy maybe eight times now, so I oh, think wow. there's a reason why. That you have Italian roots? Yeah, if you go far back enough. Okay. But uh, I usually just say no, because I think we all have roots everywhere if you really go far okay, back okay. enough. But I speak um, a fair amount of Italian. Yeah. You speak Spanish yeah. as well, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Now, when you look at... Your view of the world, how would you, has it changed dramatically in the last, over the period of years? Have you gone through periods where you were kind of thinking you had things figured out and then you made a big shift? Or has it been kind of a slow and steady as you go kind of progression? No, I think, Tommy, you hit the nail on the head the first time in the sense that, you know, I grew up with my mom especially. She was a very strong figure in my life. And right through my late 20s, I would argue. Uh, I had a very definite set view of the world and me and my upbringing, and I was very much a person who, unless you agreed with the way I thought, um, I certainly wouldn't make you feel bad or anything, but I wouldn't change my mind and wouldn't be looking to change my mind. Um, that certainly changed over the last 10 years or so, and exponentially, in the sense that if you would have asked me eight years ago, I would be more flexible and um, open-minded than I, you know, than I was ten years ago. And if you asked me five years ago, more so than eight, and so on. And if you ask me now, more so than two years ago. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, I think, the travel and the uh, psychological and uh, philosophical exploration that I've kind of organically undertaken in the last three or four years. You've mentioned last week that you have done some writing, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that really interests me because that is such a hard thing to do mm. and you need to have an understanding of people if you're going to write you were saying you write fiction correct mm -hmm. yes, yes so in order to write good fiction you really have to have an understanding of people i and would agree with you yes i would agree some people might not but i would <laughs> and i would like to think that i do have that understanding of people but you know it's it's a very challenging thing to do so yeah. you were talking a little bit about developing characters sure yes can you describe that process of trying to write a character, maybe developing him or her, and then coming up, 
out with this story rather than staring at the page and having the blood come out your ears. <laughs> I know the feeling. I know what you mean. Um, yeah, I think that writing is, by definition, a very lonely and individualistic uh, creative process. Uh, it's really just the writer and the page in front of them. And that can manifest itself in many ways. When you say it's difficult, I think most writers would agree with you because it's very hard to, you're creating a world is really what you're doing in that page, in that book that you're trying to communicate. So essentially what I'm trying to do, and I think most writers would agree, is take the thoughts that are in their head. They're all over the place, experiences, remembrances, creativity, whatever it might be that's floating up there, and make it into this semblance stream of consciousness that you call writing or that one calls writing. That is uh, certainly hard. For me, what I've tried to do is I initially think about things, whether it's in the shower or I'm cooking or something. I'll start creating some of these worlds. I'll start saying, let's say right now if I'm working, right now I'm working on a book that's a political thriller based in Europe and the U.S., right? So the immediate thought that starts coming to my mind is what kind of world should this be? Is this a dystopia? Is this a current events? If it's current events, then I start thinking about what I've read over the last month. What's going on in the world? You know, what is Putin doing? What is, how is Trump uh, reacting? How is the U.S. Senate, uh, you know, reacting to what Trump is doing? And these disparate pieces that exist in my mind, based on fact, based on experience, based on thoughts, based on creativity, start coalescing themselves before I ever sit down to write. I start having an idea, for instance, where Putin is making a push into Central Europe because the EU is falling apart. So the natural question becomes, why is the EU falling apart? Now I have to create a character that might be driving this, right? And so I might draw on something I would have read from you know, 20 years ago or something, some guy that was uh, a terrorist that was arrested by Israeli IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, and this is why he was arrested. I might not remember that, but I'll go online and look that person up, read his history and say, hmm, can I create a character around a similar history and kind of insert and then build the world off of there? Because now you have a quote unquote terrorist who is trying to push for a goal based on a wider scheme. Now you have to, now you have structure, at least I do. And then I can start fleshing out these worlds. So you're going on three different levels there. You're having that worldview, and then you're talking about maybe like the, the specific events that happen that, you know, it's not like a global issue, but just intermediate level. And then you're also talking about how it's gonna impact individuals. I think you have to. I think uh, if you're gonna write, because when I started this, I had these great macro ideas of global events like you're talking about, and I guarantee you nobody would read it, except for maybe the really nerdy policy wonk guy who really likes this stuff. Because if you really want to connect with a broader audience, they have to care about the character. And um, I've had people in my life who have been very helpful in that. They're much more in touch with their emotions. This is even before I started delving into my ex understandings of emotions. That told me, you know, frankly, Anthony, why do I care about this character that you're writing? I mean, I think this is a great story. I think the worlds you're creating are awesome. But why do I care about this character? I need some emotion. And when I asked what they meant by emotion, they wanted, you know, that sense of struggle, that sense of being lost, that sense of redemption, that sense of wanting to understand, which we're all doing, right? I mean, that's kind of what we're doing in this wonderful podcast that you've created. We're all doing that at some level, even if you're a terrorist trying to change the world or a president trying to govern a country, we're all on that journey. And so if you're going to create these worlds, you have to create these characters that people will care about because they're on the same journey. Now, getting that feedback, you were mentioning writing is a very lonely process, Iso can be an isolated, in my words, isolated mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. project. You're saying you get fee frequent feedback. Yeah. And that can be... That can be a little scary to show somebody something that you poured your heart out into and said, what do you think? And you don't know what's going to be the reaction. <clears throat> now, do you find that getting a frequent feedback helps you rather than saying, okay, I just spent a year or two years writing this. What do you think? And yeah. someone says, oh, <laughs> that stinks. <laughs> or, oh, and then you're saying, well, hopefully it's brilliant. Yeah. How does that help you along the way? You, you get a cor lot of course corrections? Yeah, sure. So I think I think you're referring to kind of the, the craft and how it kind of comes together. I think that's a great question. Um, for certain, I suspect that it's very individualistic. Again, it's a very individualistic process, as you said. And so everybody approaches it differently. I can tell you what I've read and I can tell you what I do. What I've read from folks, from many authors, is work on a piece, right? And if you're a listener and you're looking to write, I mean, I'm sure this is great advice. 
but you know write your piece out just flow of consciousness write it out create those characters create those worlds flesh it out uh and then put it away and put it away for six months don't edit it yourself don't show it to anyone else just put it away do another work go hike the world out and whatever it is that you're going to do but then come back after six months edit it right you're going to find a ton of mistakes um and then try and show it to somebody that's really close to you that you care about i don't approach it that way um i like to have more real-time feedback so usually i approach it more on a chapter basis i'll write out one or two chapters and show it to somebody that I really care about in that situation. For instance, if I'm writing a character that has to be very emotional, I have luckily people in my life that I know are very in touch with their emotions. They can express them, they understand them, they feel them, so I'll run it by them. If it's something more intellectual, like it's uh, some chapter that has more to do with the structures between systems in the world, right? Capitalism versus this or that, I might reach out to a professor or say something like, you know, hey, I'm thinking about saying that uh, you know, the socialists take over Europe because of this reason or so. Is this plausible? And they'll give me some feedback as to maybe why it's not or why it is and then flesh out the chapter and then usually come back and try and tie it all together into a cohesive narrative, which would be the ultimate book. But I do that kind of in real time, but um, with some pauses, I will be honest. In other words, I'll write the chapter out, say today, get some feedback, let you take your time. You might take a month to get back to me. That's fine because I'm already thinking about other projects and other ways the story might develop. When I get the feedback back, I usually tend to implement it in a way that I think best fits what I'm trying to tell in the story. And it helps tremendously. So I'm, I'm hearing that you have an exchange of people mm -hmm. of you yes. knowing the person that you're going to for the advice. Yeah, that's key. I would expect that, that in most cases you get a very friendly response of, yes, people would like to help you. Yeah, mostly. Uh, like time can be an issue, but yeah. But I'm, I'm looking in terms of uh, how we... You don't exist on your own. Mm. We always have some sort of framework mm -hmm. that we're interacting with people. So even if you're writing Anthony's book, mm -hmm. it's also other people coming into that. And you know what they can help you with. Mm -hmm. And you know what they have to offer. That Yes. Now, are there other things where you've reached out to people? Well, you've helped me out here with this podcast is one great example. But do you find that in that inner circle, maybe, of a, a way of describing it, do you try to seek out opportunities to help people and say, hey, I think somebody's not a book project, but some, something that they may find you a good resource for, for help with? I try to uh, I try to do that, Tommy. In fact, as you saw with your own podcast, I, I, I'd like to you know think that I gave you some positive feedback. Um, uh, I think your podcast is great, by the way. I think you're doing great work here. Well, thank you. Um, thank absolutely. you very much. Absolutely. Add a review and subscribe and click like. <laughs> absolutely. I, I strongly recommend it. I think the direction, Tommy, like we discussed a little earlier, is you're really giving folks a voice that might not otherwise easily access some of these larger issues. Um, and I try to surround myself with folks. I, I'm, I'm a very good judge of character. You have to know your strengths. Um, you, you can't be cocky, but you have to know your strengths. And what I've realized is that, and we can talk about this in another time, but through my childhood, I've learned to read people's emotions through their physical and facial expressions very well. And so I'm able to meet with people, connect with them, and understand pretty quickly kind of their position on things, on life, on what they, you know, are they, do they need my help? Do they care for it? Uh, and I tend to surround myself with folks that I think I might be able to add value for. Uh, and I bring them into my circle as long as they would like to stay. And that's kind of determined by them and by me. And by me, it means how can I help them? So to answer your question, Tommy, a little earlier you asked about my personal philosophy. If I did have a personal philosophy, I don't know, I've co you know congealed it very well yet. But if I have, I think it's based on four points. Um, I like to learn. Huge, huge. You might have noticed even when we talked about the book descriptions, it's based on my, my own learnings a lot. I love to learn whether, you know, a lot of folks say I like to learn. I'm talking about understanding why a car works, even though you have no business in being a mechanic or even, you know, fixing it or anything. It just is interesting to you. That's the kind of learning I'm talking about. Now, the, you're, to get into that more, the process of learning. Yeah enjoying that process yes. even though you're not going to go out yes. and be fixing your not car necessarily actually. correctly i may but but the the fact that i want to know why a drive shaft connects to a certain part of the engine and how that turns the wheels might be very interesting to me 
because I don't know when it might be useful. And in my books, it, it, you know, when you say, how do I create these worlds? I might create a situation. I'm going to create, I haven't done this yet. Just right now, in the moment, I'm going to create a scene, let's just say. I'm creating a scene where there is a person who is integral to the, to the plot line who I want to kill off, right? So you could say, and then he died. Or you can describe him shifting through the gears because you know he's based in Asia, which is mostly a manual transmission drive country uh, world uh, society. So he's shifting through the through the gears, uh, and uh, the brakes are no longer responding to him, and so now the car is completely out of control, careening towards an absence that he did not expect. And so now you start fleshing out these worlds where the reader can say, "Oh my God, I can see myself in this car trying to shift." Trying to press the brakes and it's not working and then i might say what he didn't know what let's let's call him tommy mm -hmm. what tommy didn't know was that earlier in the day uh you know agents of the saudi government had slipped under his car and severed the wire you know between the drive shaft and the engine component and so this gives detail that fleshes out a world to the reader and lets them think of this henchman you know sneaking around skulking around the car and setting up now this scene that they're reading where this poor guy is going to die that's the kind of emotion I think that people can connect with and really builds out a character and a scene rather than just, you know, and the ambassador hopped in his car and died, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it's, it's very interesting the way you, you presented that. Something that is, to me, something that is as mundane as the inner workings of the car. Mm -hmm. And then you're turning that into something that's an incredibly imaginative story. <laughs> yeah. And you're molding those two together. Yeah, it's a very interesting process of collecting information. Yeah, and doing it intentionally, and then in the back of your mind having an idea that you can can fit this into that imagination of a world that you're going to create. It's um structured. Yeah. And free flowing. Yes. At the same time. Yes. Which. I don't know if you recognize that yourself, but that, I don't think that a lot of people have that. Have developed that. I, I I would say that I think more people have it than they think. I didn't know it was like that until again. I've been very lucky to surround myself with very very special people, friends, dear friends of mine, who in their actions and the things they say, you know, awaken my perception of this. In other words, I didn't know that I had those talents either until they started speaking to me about things matter of factly. And I'm thinking, well, I didn't really think about it that way. I didn't really structure it that way. And then I started looking and seeing, oh, I'm doing this kind of unconsciously. In other words, I like to always learn. And I always used to think, yeah, you know, I have a lot of random uh, knowledge. Like, I'm a great guy to talk to if you want to have a beer and just answer random questions. I will answer them for <laughs> you or at the very least tell you the limits of what I do know and not know and probably where to look for the rest. Um, okay, that's great for trivia, right? Sure. <laughs> but right. what else can it be good for? And what I've learned is that uh, both on a mentoring scale, I have a mentee that I mentor at the Stanford Public Schools. I, I would argue it gives me more than he's ever going to get because I'm able to share uh, these worlds in actuality, right? How I grew up, Stanford as an education system, whatever the case might be. These are real worlds with this young individual who is just feeling his way out. Um, and so if I can create a positive energy in that situation, that's hugely beneficial for myself. So that's in the actual. In my creativity, it also allows me to create these worlds, just as you said, because there are points of learning that exist, kind of free-floating, as you described, it's a perfect description. Um, but they're not lost. Um, I know in the back of my head that uh, there was a civil war in Greece in the 1960s, but that's about all I really know, because that's all I got from the documentary I watched. But that's enough for me to go back to Wikipedia, you know, love mm -hmm. the internet or whatever other sites, and mm -hmm. understand the characters, the dates. I don't think you necessarily need to have the dates and the characters and the exact events as long as you know what to look for, which is, I think, the central premise of the liberal arts education, right? In other words, they're not going to give you all the information, but they're going to teach you how to teach yourself. That's a liberal arts education. I had a really good liberal arts education, too, so that's part, part of it as well. You're, you're jogging my mind a little bit here, and one thing I want to touch on you is that open-mindedness to exploring new things and then piece of advice that I think is good that I can't remember where I got it from but to own, have ownership of of your position and sometimes I would feel like I'm at a civil war of being open-minded looking at different sources always saying well I'm always going to keep the the discussion open 
or owning a position and saying, I'm going to be shut down and, and on a spot. Like you were saying, when you were younger, you were, you were more of had things figured out. Mm-hmm. How do you balance that? Uh, well, Tommy, you're asking a very, very big question. I love questions like this, but you have to bear with me here because I'm gonna have to deconstruct a little. Uh uh-huh. yeah. What you're absolutely. touching on, what you what you're touching on is kind of what the philosophers that you've been touching on your podcast have been building up since the pre Socratic times as you as you spoke about, which I think was a great analysis as to how the progression evolves and how you have to kind of understand that to be able to build things out. For me personally, I you as you said, you have to understand them all. And once you've done that, or at least read them or been exposed to their thoughts, I think most people kind of focus on a few philosophers that they really appreciate. For me, it's been um, Jung, Carl Jung, Swiss philosopher, uh, as well as Nietzsche, who was a German uh, philosopher. They lived about the same times. And what them, along with Freud, who was an Austrian psychologist, what they all explored was this larger, where do we fit in, in the psyche? In other words, this mind that we call the psyche, the different psychologists have described them differently, but they all share in common that there were components that somehow interacted both internally and externally with the world. And so when you ask, for instance, how do I reconcile that view of I have my fixed position, but I also want to have an open mind, as you described, you're kind of flirting with these psychological stases that have been explored, have been talked about in the past, which is... How do I define myself as the individual? How do I see the world as a whole? And how does that individual, in this case, you would describe it as the persona, how does that persona fit into the larger collective conscious, right? For me, it's been very important to deconstruct where I came from, how I was raised, why did I have those initial thoughts in the first place? You know, why did I see that world in such a myopic, hard-headed, I know best way? Where did that come from? You know, which in many ways goes back to my parents and their upbringing and where did it come from for them? What kind of interactions I had as a kid with my teachers and my classmates? All that came into play to create my persona, if you will. That state of psyche that Jung would say is what you show the world, that initial mask. And most of us, you, you know, like you said, it's very hard to kind of reconcile that and to, and to do that. Most of us just kind of flow through the world with that persona and say, this is who I am, right? I'm an accountant. You know, I have a family. I pay the bills and people rely on me and that's why I am. Great. Mm-hmm. But there's so many more layers to every individual, no matter how simple or complicated they may be, that most times they're not being accessed. They're either part of the subconscious or ignored or repressed. And you have to at least have a semblance of an idea of that world to be able to be open-minded for a change of thought. Because if you don't, if you reject it, if you say, this is who I am and take it or leave it, how can you be open to a new view from another country, another person, another sex, another race? You can't because you know best. You're protecting that persona, right? This is who I am. Been like this 35 years. I'm not going to change. You know? That's a great word. You use protection. Yeah. Um, It, It is. I would say that it's it's to that persona that you put it onto the world, but it's also to yourself. Absolutely. And you had mentioned ruthless being ruthlessly honest. Yes. I found that I'm able to to lie to myself quite a bit about emotions. We all do. And I don't even realize it, and I'm not even consciously trying to do that. Absolutely. It seems like you. You do have that authenticity to you, and and this is Anthony. (laughs) It's a process. I would not stand here and tell you that I figured all this out. In fact, uh, I believe it was you who also said the process, the point of all this is to individuate, right? To excel in the process of individuation, which essentially to oversimplify you. He's saying you want to bring together the unconscious, the conscious, the subconscious, uh, which is made up of parts of the darkness, which is repressed stuff, the persona, what you show the world, uh, and I believe it's the anima and the animus, right? Those bridges between the unconscious and the subconscious and the individual. When you bring all of that together, eventually you get this archetype called, I believe it's called the uh, the, 
the self, like the, the true self, the, the know thyself and be true that we always hear for thousands of years, the be to thine own self be true, Shakespeare says. It's all commonly linked, which is get to that true self by exploring all these parts. And if you can do that, you've gotten pretty damn close to individuation. And why does that matter? Because if you understand yourself, you can be a productive member of a larger collective, whether it's a society, a country, a company, a relationship. You have to figure that out to be productive or to give of your time, for instance, to meaningfully help somebody or something. You can, you can do it, and many folks do, but how, how much value can you add if you don't quite know where you're coming from and what you're sharing and how people see you? I feel like I'm sitting with my mentor. <laughs> <laughs> For our listeners, is there like that one piece that you would want to say, one piece of advice that you could give somebody that may be searching for answers or trying to find their way through life? Where would you try to lead them? Uh, Tommy, so I would say, if, I, if you said, Anthony, you got to say it in one word, right? right. I would say think. Right. And then you say, well, give me more. And then I would say, well, think for yourself. Uh, and then if you say, give me more, you know, I would like to share with you. I have I'll give you four um, four we, parts to my philosophy. First point. Yeah. We yeah. So we, we covered the yeah, learn part. Right. That was great. Um, also, uh, try to give of yourself. Right. I try to give of myself. So we covered that, I think, uh, enough for you to kind of get an idea. Um, that's a second component. The third component is admit errors, faults and follow up. So we kind of touched on that just now, where if you are confident enough in yourself because you've taken this time to explore, although I would argue you don't have to take the time to explore to say, hey, I can be wrong. Many of us don't do that. Many of us just assume the persona has to be right. And I, it, listen, I'm a mechanic. I've done this for 30 years. I know that it's not the brakes. Well, maybe it could be the brakes. And but because this woman is wearing heels and she's telling you it could be brakes, you have to reinforce the persona that you're the smart mechanic that should know better so she doesn't. And she may. So you don't have to go through this, I think, exploration to be able to admit you could be wrong. It doesn't mean you are wrong. But to be able to do that through life, admit errors and faults, lets you then to follow up and fix them. If you want to, right? You could ignore them, as you said, to protect your yourself. You could ignore them. But I would argue that most people, if not all people, would ri live richer lives mentoring, helping, giving of themselves, exploring, learning, traveling, if they are able to say, hey, I used to think that America is the greatest country in the world, so I don't have to leave it. But it turns out this country in Argentina or this country in Zimbabwe is amazing, beautiful, blah, blah, blah. You're literally admitting an error, right? You're literally saying maybe the U.S. isn't the best in whatever right natural mm -hmm. beauty whatever it is. soccer soccer <laughs> whatever it is. exactly maybe the sport perfect example you know i think american football is the best sport you know like it's the best because of why because your your dad liked it because your brothers liked it because you have fond memories watching the game great that's wonderful but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best sport you might think it's the best sport so to be able to say well there might be other sports out there i would like to explore them you have some humility there and I think that's necessary. That's part and parcel to the admit the errors and faults. Comes to mind when you're saying that is that when you see an arrogant person, they're not, you say, oh, that person thinks they're so much better. But there's a lot of that bravado comes from feeling like you're not better and you maybe are compensating for that. Mm -hmm. It's what's that source of that certainty is kind of your anxiety and not knowing mm -hmm. counterintuitively you're being aggressive but really in that person's head it's being defensive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so it's a pride and humility kind of dance mm -hmm. with, each, with each other yeah that's a great characterization tommy i think that's <clears throat> excuse me probably the best way to paint that dynamic um and i think you're hitting the nail on the head in the sense that when we have, this is all Jungian, this is why I love Carl Jung, because he touches on this, right? He says, we project, and Freud touches on projection as well, um, but Jung says, we project the darkness within, and that darkness is usually some repressed, you know, uh, think of the little kid who asked for the cookie and is not allowed, his hand is slapped and it goes back in its pocket, right? 
That's mm-hmm. kind of what happens emotionally, according to Jung, with folks is, you know, uh, the, the little boy shows some sexual animus to animals, right? And so the parents freak out and say, no, that's really bad, you know, and they slap him down and then say, never do that again. Okay, well, mm-hmm. he'll never display that again to the parents, but that goes into the shadow, at least according to Jung. It goes right. into that darkness of a repressed, you know, interest or feeling or curiosity. And so as a kid grows, it might manifest itself subconsciously or unconsciously in many ways, right? Maybe he acts out against women or maybe he has an affinity towards bears. I mean, you have cosplay people that <laughs> like this kind of stuff and you don't understand why. A lot of it has those roots, right? And so that's part of that shadow, that un uh reckoned with part of our bodies uh, ourselves um and in some time some ways that can become projected to somebody else so you might have the person that says gays are bad you know gays are really bad why because religion says so okay well why does religion say so they will never ask those questions because then they have to go down a rabbit hole that makes them ultimately question themselves which i am a huge proponent of keep Mm -hmm. asking questions admit your faults and explore. This is part of my philosophy. I think if, if that individual, I'm making up this archetype for the purpose sure. of the conversation, but I think we can imagine folks like this. If they go back down that rabbit hole and say, well, wait a minute, why do I hate gay people? Because of their sexual act? Not really. I kind of done that with women in, in my past, so I clearly don't hate that. So is it because you know religion says I should? not really because i've cheated and religion says i shouldn't do that so it can't be that uh-huh. you know and you start and you keep going down these questions and if they're honest with themselves they might get to a point where they say well i had an uncle you know when i was five and i i saw him kissing this man and i thought it was so gross and so bad the next question would be well why did i think it was gross and bad and then they might say well my dad you know when i was young was watching a movie and he said to me son promise me you'll never do that <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's the first memory I recall. I was watching that movie and, and Brokeback Mountain or whatever it is. Sure. And my, you know, my dad got physically angry. And all I remember was anger and ugliness equals men kissing. So when I saw it with my uncle, which was very close to me, do you see where I'm going with this? So right. This is how kids kind of develop uh, and then eventually end up projecting. One question leads to another. And you... With that brutal honesty, see yeah. That how uncomfortable can I be answering questions? Now, I mean, if being about gay or being whatever it is, any topic, race, it could be anything, any poverty, race. anything, yeah. Right, you're set you on something, and you keep going down and keep asking those questions, yeah, until you get to that really uncomfortable place, and you want to say, yeah. stop the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, you're reminding me of kind of a. <clears throat> it's a what, form of self therapy. What I've tried to learn about meditation. Yeah. That you have an emotion or you have a thought. You got angry about something. You got angry at somebody. Sure. And then you say, why did I get angry or why did I think about that? That's a great question. And it takes a long time to get to the root of it and to to say, oh, I'm really experiencing this on a much deeper level than I was before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you're describing is an incredibly difficult journey for people to take to say, you know, what is, what are my emotions? (laughs) You know, Tommy, I I agree with you. And uh, for me, the crux of what we're talking about right now has really just evolved in the last 30, in the last three years, three to four years, exponentially. So again, four years ago, I would have known less and explored less and had less courage than I would two years ago and so on. I'm 36, right? So if you put it in context, that means it took me a better part of 30 years. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a lot of folks in... You You've know, done it quickly. <laughs> no, no. I would argue it's been very late, right? I mean, you have folks in the street making, you know, millions of dollars and they're younger than me. I mean, you can go very far, quote unquote, in the world without figuring this stuff out. Um, and I would argue, not just myself, but many psychologists in the past would say that it would be beneficial to the society if we all had at least some level of exposure to this um, level of self-actualization. When you say, Tommy, you made a great point, and if I may, I want to explain a process that I kind of figured out. Uh, you said it's very scary to go down that road, and it is. And I think part of the reason why it's scary, aside from the psychological psychoses that have been explained by Freud and Jung and Nietzsche and all the rest of them, that all is very real, I'm sure. 
But another very practical reason why it's scary to go down those rabbit holes is because you don't know what the structure is. This goes back to what I said about me needing structure on things. Mm -hmm. I'm a little afraid if I don't know where – what holds this up. Some people have literally gone mad doing some of this stuff in history. I mean we, we know painters, we know artists that have literally gone mad exploring these rabbit holes. So I think there's a bit of a stigma there. That we all have that we carry with ourselves which is that it's a scary closet you're coming out of the closet right if you're gay and you've, mm -hmm. you've hit it uh, you're in the darkness if you don't know you're showing the light if you bring somebody in the motif there is that it's a scary dark place that you you want to hide from or hide in for me what i've used to be able to understand that is that i've added a structure to that world Right. In psychology, there is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. It's a very known subject. It's been known for over, I think, 80 years, um, which basically says that emotions control your actions based on your thoughts. In other words, what you feel as an emotion is controlled at least by your thoughts, which then lead to actions. Right. What you feel is controlled by your thoughts, which lead to action. Right. And there's a conflation there between feeling and emotions as one and the same. How do you feel? I feel happy. How do you feel right now? I feel jealous, right? And so there is this belief that emotions and feelings are the same. They are controlled by your thoughts, and this leads to actions. I'll give you a quick example. If you're afraid of spiders and you go to a cognitive behavioral therapist, what they're going to do is expose you to the spider. And first, a small little cute one, right? And then a larger one, and then a hairier one, and then a heavier one, and then a scarier one, and first on your tip of your feet, and then on your leg, and then on your arm, and then on your face, because they're exposing your thoughts to the idea that it is not hurting you, and therefore your emotion shouldn't be fear, but rather something else. It could be welcoming, it could mm -hmm. be cute, it could be whatever it is. And then your action is not to run away screaming, but rather to hold it, or to caress it, or to at the very least not worry about it. That's cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Mm -hmm. So what I've learned through my explorations is what I call, well, you know, it's no fancy name, but I call it Anthony's version of cognitive behavioral therapy. I would argue that external feelings you have no control over, right? If I were mm -hmm. to punch you in the back right now, that is a feeling you will have. You cannot control that. You cannot stop me, really, if I sneak up on you, from mm -hmm. punching you. You felt it, no control, right? This has to go through your internal thought and perceptions, you know, what you think about being hit in the back. That you have control over, right? That's part of the cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. You can say, for instance, this is a man trying to hurt me, or you can say, he's trying to pat me in the back, but he slipped and his arm went all the way to my chest. Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Those are your thoughts. You can control that. This then flows through your internal emotions, right? If you thought that I just slipped and hit you by accident, you might say, oh, let me support him. Maybe he's slipping, he's falling. He's a nice guy. Or if your thoughts are, he's trying to hurt me, the world's trying to hurt me, I need to turn around and swing him right in the face, right? Right. That you have almost no control over anymore because your emotions are being dictated by what you could control, your thoughts. Right. So now you're expressing the emotion, anger, fear, happiness, whatever it is. Then it goes through the an internal slash external action, which you have some control over. You could in that moment say, I'm angry, I'm pissed, but I'm not going to punch him because he's my boss and I'm going to get fired. But if I could, man, I would. So you have some control, right? Because you can not punch him in the action stage, but you, you no longer control that emotion. You are still angry. And Eventually, these actions, when they become repetitive enough over time since you were a baby, they then become habits or addictions. So for instance, then it becomes a situation where I always hit back when I get touched and it becomes this habit where you are quote unquote violent. Anyone that touches you, you have to lash back. We know kids like this in school. You reacted to it one way, it solved the problem. And now next time going forward, I see that I'm going to do the same thing. Yeah. And the younger this happens, the more ingrained it can become. And most of our habits today, I would argue, and addictions, whether you smoke, eat too much. In my case, I've always had a relationship with food that's not always been constructive. Um, that's part of what's led me down this path, by the way. I think most of the folks that are able to grasp this stuff usually get there a little earlier when they go through some traumatic event like a bulimia or over drinking or a sex addiction or whatever it is that, that happens. They kind of have to go down these rabbit holes because they have to, whether they're getting therapy from some, hopefully some medical professional, or if they do it internally like I have. It's all the same in the sense that you're going through a therapy. 
you're seeking rewards, it seems kind of you've you kind of touched on that of reacting in a certain way. You want to hit your boss and then you get a reward from that. Mm. But then you're kind of saying question that initial want for the reward and and try to slow down the response mm -hmm. and make a different response and then change the reward. Yeah. There's a wonderful book, I'm sure most people have read this or at least know about it, called The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, right? It's a thin book. It's a paperback. You can read it in a day. It has a lot of great information, and he does a great job. I forget the author right now, but he does a Stephen great Stephen Covey. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. Um, Stephen Covey does a great job of explaining the mechanical, uh, you know, uh, flesh outs, if you will, of habits, how they form, how to change them, how to stop them, so on and so forth. That's fantastic. I would argue that once you're at that stage, if you haven't gone through this process I just described, you know, it's kind of like painting a car and not taking it apart. Underneath, in the jams, underneath the car, inside, it's all going to be green even if you painted it white. So, yeah, you're driving around in a quote-unquote white car, but it's not going to be really white, right? Even though you painted it, it's going to be whatever color it was before. And the first chance, a acidic rain or whatever, it's going to peel off and it's going to look ugly and it's still going to be in a green car. I would argue that if you approach it from that perspective on the habit side, yeah, you might change your habit, but it's going to come back because you haven't figured out the train of thought that brings you from that feeling to the addiction or the habit. You see what I'm saying? You see it, I think, in sports uh, figures. You see it a lot. Uh, I know, Tommy, you, you're you very athletic yourself, and I'm sure you have. <laughs> yeah, you are. You <laughs> do great stuff. You've done great stuff. You push your body. You know where, 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 where people are coming from when they talk about their bodies. You know, athletes – because they had been conditioned from an early age, in my experience, in my view, are able to train that thought pattern so that they interpret certain feelings and emotions and actions and so on differently than the rest of us. For instance, I am not that athletic. I have a pain in my leg, in my knee. It's time to stop. Like I should go home and watch TV. The athlete knows his body well enough because he's felt or she's felt that feeling before. And she knows that the emotion of fear or laziness or whatever it might be is just that an emotion they power through you hear it all the time i power through i'm in the zone well but it's also when you feel that pain in your knee mm. my thought is when i've tried to power through things in my very limited athletic ability but if i try to power through things i think it's more of ego and pride mm. come into that i think it's a symptom of getting a little bit older mm. Now I'm in my early 40s, and I say, well, I don't have to be the fastest guy out here. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be the best. I can respond to the little things that my body's telling me. Like when you got, you were talking about before, the, being sensitive to your reactions and understanding, oh, I somebody tapped me on the back and I want to hit him. The more sensitive you can become to those inputs and say, okay, catching it early and mm -hmm. saying, oh, this is happening, I'm going to respond. Yeah. Or say, I'm a little nervous, my heart rate got a little faster just now, I'm like public speaking, whatever. Oh, right away, start breathing slowly and relax, rather than saying, okay, so now I'm sweating, I need water, now I need to relax. To me, it's been a, a, um, a new approach for me to say I don't have to be powering through, I can respond more and try to be more humble. So that's mindfulness, Tommy. What you just described is mindfulness. Um, and the reason why I describe those steps that I described to you, uh, you know, starting with the external feelings and ending up in habits and addictions and actions, they're really actions, it's crucial for me, right? I'm not saying it's got to be true for everybody. I suspect it may be, but I try not to say it has to be. But for me, it's crucial to understand that structure because it gives me a bit of a scaffolding when I go into this dark place. And why does one go into that dark? Why do I go into the dark place? To understand myself so that I can mindfully do things. For instance, I'll give you a personal example, a very personal example. I've had a weight issue. Only recently have I realized that part of the reason why I eat or overeat and therefore gain weight is because I've connected emotions with the act of eating. So when I went through uh, this process here that I just described, I was able to hone in on where can I be mindful? And so the mindful stage is the initial, the difference between an emotion and a feeling. See, a feeling is, uh, you know, um, not doing anything, laying in bed with nothing to do. It's not really an emotion. You can feel the emotion of loneliness, of boredom, and so on. But the feeling of just being in the bed doing nothing is a feeling. 
my thoughts for me personally was at this point I should eat right that's the thing to mm-hmm. do when you feel this eat the emotion then became a hunger a curiosity to go to the fridge to see what's there and then you end up eating something because now you're no longer controlling the emotions now it becomes this misguided hunger it's not hunger it's just this malinterpretation of these actions the ultimate action being eating and you do that over time it becomes a habit then it becomes an addiction and now you eat for whatever reason that's an expression of an emotion so the action is the expression of the emotion which was controlled by my thoughts which were kicked off by the feeling and that got conflated over the years to any emotional connection became eating you see what i'm saying any expression uh-huh. of an emotion should be done through food is what my thoughts came to do, to 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 believe i have to de- and i'm working on that now as you might be able to see uh, i'm working on that now to deconstruct that but if i didn't understand this flow that i just described where do i begin most people see the diet industry is making billions every year because they're saying you don't have to figure any of this out right. all you have to do is buy this machine Follow, and follow do our it, steps. Follow our steps. And the quote unquote better ones, like the Weight Watchers, they are externalizing this process and taking it off your hands and saying, if you just go to these meetings, if you just eat this many calories, if you keep to this many points, you will lose. And most people do lose the weight. But as soon as they leave the program, it all comes back. Why? Because they never understood this process. They never understood why are they eating in the first place. All they were doing was, as I said earlier, painting the car white, right? They're not. Mm-hmm deconstructing it and painting every little part like they should they're just painting the car white so now they have a white car well guess what when the paint dries i mean when the paint runs you have a green car you always had a green car you never took it apart and you never fixed it the part of what you were saying just now that hits me hardest is the spectrum of emotions Mm. and recognizing something as an emotion even though it's not like a strong feeling of joy or sadness or something that hits you hard but you're saying you know you're you're home you you sat down on the couch and nothing's gripping you at that moment you're describing that as an emotion which is not how i would typically say well somebody's bored is that an emotion not really but you're talking about being very sensitive to what's going on in your head yes and that (laughs) that just makes me see my reaction to things differently if i say even just the most mundane occurrence like my problem is my mind gets idle and then i'll think of something that happened 20 years ago and i'll say that sob did whatever and i'll say what's triggering this but then if you if i look at it through what you just described it's, oh, I had an emotion of boredom. <laughs> my mind didn't know where to go. Maybe. It was just kind of here, hanging out, and my mind said, oh, we've experienced this before. Let's think about something from 20 years ago. Now, you could were be. saying you take a trot, trot over to the refrigerator, but for me, I go, ooh. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm pissed. Yeah. Could be. I think that's, that's part of the analysis part. The questions, as you described earlier, the question after a question you have to keep asking the question until you get to the lowest common denominator and that usually mean that's the, usually the point where you say where well, it doesn't make any sense anymore right if you go eventually down far enough you might get to an answer because i was born well that doesn't help you so you've gone too far i think usually yeah <laughs> you, got, yeah you know what i mean like, yeah, in other words, like, yeah why was i why do i live in stanford because my parents brought me here why did they bring me here because they were escaping persecution in columbia why were they escaping persecution eventually oh. it's because well you know they were born <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> so you you, you kind of most of us will be able if we really open ourselves up we'll be able to intuit you know at least that at least the initial levels you might not get to the basement just yet and that's part of therapy right there's people that pay time what i'm talking about here and what you're talking about is stuff that people with better means spend tens of thousands of dollars across dozens of years sometimes in therapy to figure out. It's not easy and it's a little bit scary, but if you do it right and if you do it yourself, I would argue, it is so much more rewarding because you find out who you are and why you are. And when you get there, 
it becomes so much easier to understand those around you and eventually the world, right? So to bring it back full circle to what you were talking about in your early podcast episodes, which is I'm trying to figure out myself. These are big questions. What is the world about? You know, we're going to get to the answer. Ultimately, from my perspective, now this is Anthony speaking. I don't want to put it on anybody else, but Anthony would say, if you figure out your origins, who you are, why you are the way you are, how you see the world and how you treat others around you, you'll be able to understand how they see you. And if you can do that, you can connect empathetically with what they're about, which will reflect on you. What are you about, right? If you surround yourself with murderers, are you a nice guy? So, you know, and you can figure that out. And once you do that, you start seeing these macro archetypal patterns in others, in your boss, in your previous girlfriend, in Putin, in whatever. And you can start making these connections as to why things happen. Why is Russia behaving the way it does? Why does my boss want to fire such and such? You can start figuring these things out when you're able to understand what drives it. And you can't get there until you look inside first. Now, this again, this is part of the Anthony philosophy. So I don't want to say this is the, this is what I described about the process from We're feelings. We're here to talk about the Anthony philosophy. <laughs> Thank you, Tommy. So what I described about feelings to, emo, to actions, I think that's pretty universal, to be honest with you. But I would love to talk to more trained folks about that. Let's put that aside. What I'm talking about now is more my ideas. In fact, I'm writing a book about this. It's a fictional book. It's a sci-fi book. I suspect that as people, we're made up of three things. Hardware, our bodies, right? Everything from your brain to your toes, right? That's our hardware. Software, that's our mind, right? That's the stuff that you know powers it and makes us think the way we do and so on and so forth. And then there's a third component, which was base, which is essentially the base uh, coding language, right? What fleshes out the mind to be able to power the body. And that, I suspect, is emotions. Mm -hmm. In other words, and when I mean emotions, Tommy, if you're anything like me, up until almost recently, I used to think emotions was sadness, jealousy, you know, you're being very emotional, which means you're yelling. I mean, there's negative connotations there. If someone said to me, Cynthia is an emotional person. I would immediately understand them saying that they she probably cries too much, she lashes out, blah, 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 all these negative connotations. That's a wrong understanding of emotions. Emotions are much simpler and much bigger than that. And any psychologist will explain this to you. It's not this part, this section only is not answered. This is known. Mm -hmm. An emotion is simply a feeling that the body has driven by some thought this is what we talked about earlier right that's cognitive behavioral therapy that's emotion mm -hmm. essentially it <clears throat> so everything from boredom to loneliness to jealousy to love to you know hatred all these are emotions okay again back to the anthony philosophy i think we've evolved in a way where the hardware and the software the body and the mind can only function evolve grow and exist through some coding, and that coding is emotions. The emotional, the way that the subconscious and evolution mm -hmm. makes you you is through emotions. And so most of us, and by most I mean like 99% probably, never understood the scaffolding that builds up these conversations of emotions and hardware and software. And so we just operate in the world. We just move. We just break up with her because she made me feel jealous. We just yell at the boss because he made me feel insecure. I leave this job because I feel useless. And we never understood what is the emotion that's being communicated to you through your mind and body. What are you really hearing? Do you feel useless because you're not doing something you love? Maybe. What do I love? Oh, shit. Now I don't know. <laughs> That's a scary <laughs> thought, right? But you got to keep delving in. Yeah. Am I creative? Am I in my heart of hearts? Do I want to dance like a ballerina even though I'm a 400-pound man? Maybe. But once you start going down that yeah. road, you say, well, am I 400 pounds because I never was fulfilled by what I really wanted to do, so I overcompensated by emotional eating? Maybe. These are questions that you have to answer, and it usually becomes much bigger than the initial question, and that's what makes it scary. But I think it makes it it's crucial to be able to be our true selves, to let our own self be true. Anthony, you've hit on so many things today. You've done so much to 
learn about yourself and the world. I just feel like we've scratched the surface <laughs> of what you can uh, teach us. So I want to thank you for coming on today. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure, and Tommy. You, you need to come back. Thank you. I will. <laughs> you, I will. Um, I have more questions. I want to be respectful of your time. Sure. But there's just so many takeaways from this. That idea of who I am and how deep I can get. And then it's funny that you even touched on, well, don't get too deep. <laughs> <laughs> don't go back to the womb. But to be on this journey... You're helping each person trying to figure out who they are and make sense of their relationship with people in their communities and then on a global scale of what is this all about. Right. So it's been an honor to have you here to have this discussion with you. Thank you so much. Tommy, I really appreciate your time. I think, you're, like I said, you're doing great work with this podcast. You're really bringing a lot of these ideas uh, accessibly. Um, if I may, I would only leave you and the audience with one last thought. Again, this can be scary, this whole process. And if you doubt as to why you should even engage in it, I will say this. What I've learned personally is that my relationships with those that I care about the most have immeasurably positively changed. And, uh, and also folks that I don't know, for instance, um, Tommy, you and I have known each other for a long time, but I would argue maybe not as close friends as others that we might have in our lives. Mm -hmm. But I'm able to easily connect with folks and help them because I've gone through this process. And that, despite some other hard times in my life right now, makes me a truly, I got to tell you, Tommy, like sometimes I think to myself, if I were to die in a car accident, I'd feel pretty good. Like it feels really good to figure out some of this stuff and to understand myself to a point where I might not have the money that I would like or the access or privilege or whatever it is that we've all grown up that we should probably want. It's a whole other topic. But just to be able to know that I understand things has given purpose in my life. And that's a deeply satisfying feeling as an individual, as a man, as a brother, as a son, as a boyfriend. Um, it's an amazing feeling. And let's leave it with those words. All right. <laughs> that is a perfect way to sum up our discussion today. So thanks everybody for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the conversation we had as much as I did. And to have a first guest, is Anthony, it's been a tremendous experience. So, everybody, take care and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>